Welcome, everybody. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here in this final webinar that CCC OER is offering for spring 2023. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for being here. Our webinar today is called The Transformative Power of OER ZTC Pathways. My name is Shinta Hernandez, and I am um, from Montgomery College, and I'm on the Executive Council of CCC OER and as the Vice President of Professional Development. And let's get started. So to give you an idea of what we will go over in this hour that we are here together, I'm going to give you a quick overview of CCC OER, and then we'll dive right into the presentations from two wonderful panelists that we have here for you. And then we will offer an opportunity for you to ask some questions to the panelists. And then in the end, we've got some um, things that we want to wrap up with, uh, wrap up of, including in, uh, upcoming events and ways in which you can stay in the loop. And then we also have a survey that we would love for you to um, fill out at the end. So a little bit about CCC OER, what is our mission? We certainly like to and want to expand awareness and increase access to high quality open educational resources, OERs. We also have a plethora of professional development, um, and so we support faculty choice and development. We foster regional OER leadership, and we improve student equity and success by way of the things that we do through CCC OER. And to give you an idea of how vast our membership is across the country and across the, the North American region, we've got 103 members across 37 states. So it's, it's really a lot, and it's I'm certainly probably growing as we speak, and, and um, we're, we're going to talk more about um, membership opportunities in a second. But if you're interested in seeing who the current members are, take a look at that URL that is at the bottom of that link, and so you can see which institutions are a part of the CCC OER membership. And speaking of membership, CCC OER is always looking for new members on our committees. And so we've got four committees um, who do a, a wide range of things that really help to promote and advance our mission. And so we've got the Professional Development Committee, the Equity and Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Membership Committee, and Research and Impact Committee. And so to find out more about what each of the committees will be doing, please, again, take a look at the URL that is at the bottom of your screen, and it is also going to be placed in the chat. Take a look, and if you're interested, definitely reach out to us. Some exciting stuff happening this summer. Um, we've got what we have is the EDI Summer Book Club, it's something that we've been doing the last couple of summers. And these are live meetings with asynchronous discussion groups um, that, and this year, our focus will be this book right here, OE Origin Stories, Pathways to the Open Movement. Um, edited by uh, Ursula Pike, who's a longtime friend of CCC OER. And this book club begins June 1st. It ends August 10th. We are in need of some facilitators. So please, if you are interested in helping us facilitate this book club discussion, reach out to us, sign up at that URL link that is at the bottom. There is training for the facilitators on May 7th. So um, please read some more, um, go into that link right there at the bottom to read more about it. And um, please, if you're interested, reach out. We would love to have you facilitate our, our book club. Another exciting thing that is happening, OE Global, Open Education Global. This year, this fall, it is happening in Edmonton, Canada. So um, please join us. It's going to be, the theme is building a sustainable world through open education, being hosted at Norquest College from October 16th through the 18th. And um, call for proposals closes next Monday. So we, do, we only have a few days left. So if you have an idea and you want to put it out there, please go ahead and submit. The URL for the conference is down below on the far left. Take a look at it, read more about it and submit your proposals and come join us in Edmonton in October of this year. As many of us know in higher ed, this is the season of awards, right? Many of us at our own institutions are handing out awards to deserved students and faculty and staff. And so we do something very similar. We've got open education awards for 2023, 
opening up next Monday. Take a look. Um, it's a wide range of different types of awards that will be uh, given. Take a look at our URL link to, to, to look at the different categories and to see the past winners and the kinds of things that have been awarded. So take a look. We're really excited about this year's uh, process again. All right, now down to the real treat here, which is the actual presentations and our wonderful panelists. I have, have the pleasure of introducing to you two people who are um, have a lot of experience in ZTC and OER pathways. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, introduce and say a little bit about themselves, and then we will get right into the presentations. So first we have here Regina Blasberg. Regina has been a full-time faculty at the College of the Canyons since fall of 2006. In addition to being chair of both the engineering technologies department and the construction management and construction technology department, she is a senator on the academic senate and served for five years as the first CTE liaison, where she established and co-chaired the career education committee. Regina implemented HyFlex instruction at College of the Canyons in 2011 and was able to transition the water program to a ZTC AS degree program over the next several years through the development of OER texts for each course in the program. Regina earned her BS in civil engineering from Loyola Marymount University and her MS in civil engineering from UCLA. I also wanna introduce Nathan Smith, Nathan is the Interim Chair of Philosophy, Humanities, and Library Sciences at Houston Community College. He has a PhD in Philosophy from Boston College and the University of Paris Sorbonne. His dissertation was on Rene Descartes' early scientific and mathematical work. He has been a full-time instructor of philosophy at Houston Community College since 2008. He has taught Introduction to Philosophy, Ethics, Logic, Classical Philosophy, Early Modern Philosophy, contemporary philosophy, and social and political philosophy. He has published on Descartes, phenomenology, and topics in open educational resources, including chapter contributions to Introduction to Philosophy Logic, and he is a senior contributing author for Introduction to Philosophy by OpenStax. In 2017, Nathan led a grant-funded initiative developing a Z degree pathway at all major campuses in the Houston Community College system. So without further ado, let me hand this Zoom over to Regina Blasberg. Hey everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invite. So I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit about the Water Systems Technology Program at College of the Canyons. It is a career education program. We offer both an Associate of Science degree and a certificate. Uh, and the goal of the program is to prepare our students for careers as a water treatment, water distribution, or wastewater operator. And in the state of California, as in most states, there is a board that requires uh, or that offers certification exams and those exams are required for employment. So we help prepare students for those exams. What you're looking at on the slide are the courses that we have within our program. The program is designed with five core courses. So they have two water math classes, a water supply, a water quality, and then a general introduction to water course. And then the students can choose whether they wish to sort of specialize in distribution treatment or wastewater. And then many of our students, especially if they're pursuing the degree, will take all of those courses as they can have certifications in more than one area and be uh, more marketable in the employment arena. Oh, Shinji, you wanna move that on there? There we go. Uh, to give everybody an idea, we're a relatively small program compared to some other uh, more mainstream programs at the colleges. Our median class size is 20. We offer 23 sections per year, uh, and we do okay in terms of our AS degrees awarded and certificates awarded. These are from the last couple years of data. And our annual student headcount within the program is around, last year it was 161, but it's in that 150 to 170 bracket most years. 
So not a gigantic program. So how did we go about developing our OER or ZTC? Like where did it come from? Uh, water programs in the state of California, there are not many, even though we have, I don't know, 115 community colleges now, 116 community colleges now. Um, but it, out of all of those, there was maybe a handful, eight, 10 colleges that offered water courses. So there was just sort of a general lack of available resources. The American Water Works Association did provide some textbooks that we could use, but at that time, they were very informational and not instructional in the way that they were designed and they were expensive. Uh, so to develop our materials, we started looking at our full-time and our part-time faculty and tried to get some combination to work on the OER materials. Initially in our one water math class, a gentleman who had been part of the program before me had developed a book and was allowing us to continue to use it until he wasn't. And of course that happened last minute. So our first book was our Water 130 uh, Introductory Mathematics, Waterworks Mathematics textbook. And that was developed by one of our part-time faculty in conjunction with myself. And then of course, we have tremendous support from our online education office and staff. James is here on the call and heads that up. And he's tremendous in getting us both financial support and other resources to get things developed. The big push came from a grant out that James was able to assist us with. And that allowed us to start moving beyond the one textbook to other textbooks as well which then required bringing in other industry experts and industry partners to help us write the content. Uh, I, at the time, was the only full-time faculty member and I am split across multiple disciplines. So it really wasn't feasible for me to be able to write all of these textbooks on my own. So I had to rely on our industry experts and our partners and of course, on additional grant funding to ensure that all of that was able to be developed in a timely manner. So our successes, as uh, Shinta mentioned in the introduction, uh, I brought HyFlex instruction to our college in 2011. HyFlex allowed our students to join our classes remotely via Zoom. And so we were able to get water students from a greater range of areas and students were able to take more classes in a semester because they didn't have to drive to campus three or four nights a week. But not having easy access to a textbook was problematic. So the OER movement within the department really helped support our high flex and it really helped support access for our students. So that has been incredibly successful for us. It uh, certainly did a lot for inclusivity and DEIA as because we developed the books, we're able to really uh, write them in such a way and in, try to include graphics and things in such a way that it is more inclusive. Uh, we also found that our books are highly, um, highly uh, accessible. And that's again, thanks very much to James' office and his staff. They do a tremendous job of editing our materials and making sure that they are fully accessible. Uh, going into this OER realm then also allowed students to access their materials, materials digitally or printed. They could print them at home. They could print them for free through our ASG student office. And then our bookstore also offers a low cost option for providing a printed copy. And of course, it's been super successful in the program as the material is very customized to our curriculum and what we are trying to do. Whereas prior, the only other option we had were the AWWA textbooks. And we then kind of had to make those work for our content. So in doing all of these things and bringing OER in, Shinta, you wanna pop it to the next slide, please. Thank you. We saw that our success and retention rates slowly began to rise. Um, and that to me was a huge benefit and improvement for our program overall. You can see back from 2014-15, 
Uh, as I mentioned, we kind of started these efforts in 2011, but it was a very slow build. And then uh, James was able to get us a grant in that, I think, 2016, 17 or 17, 18 year. And you can see as we started implementing after that, that's when we ended up with an entire pathway with OER. Then our numbers absolutely began uh, to to increase and we've been able to pretty well maintain that now for a number of years. And I really believe strongly that the o high flex paired with our OER has been really the primary reason we're seeing these improvements. Challenges, this is the cover by the way um, of our Waterworks Mathematics book currently. Uh, the biggest challenge has just been ongoing funding. As a department chair and the only full-time faculty, I didn't really understand <laughs> in jumping into this what it was going to mean to be a book publisher, which is what my department has become. It has been very challenging to continually update textbooks and to have the funding and the knowledge base to keep everything as updated as it needs to be to align with what's happening in industry and the changes that are you know happening within the water world. Uh, peer review has been a problem. We, for example, we're doing uh, CID common course numbering within the state of California. And there's so few programs in the state that it was really hard to find individuals who would be willing and able on the academic side to do a peer review of the material. Faculty workload is an issue. You know, it's not something that most of our faculty can just sort of absorb into their day to day workload of updating materials and keeping things fully current. Uh, that ties into that content expertise. If you're a, a treatment person, then you, you wouldn't necessarily be co uh, comfortable updating the wastewater content. So we always have to be hunting out that individual expertise. Academic freedom is also a concern and something we're looking at. Every faculty member is entitled to select their teaching materials. So although we have chosen this as an OER pathway for our department, we constantly have to have that discussion within the department that this is the, the way we wish to proceed and the materials that we wish to use to benefit students. So, um, and then lastly, one of the challenges was distribution. How do I, at the department level, get it out to other colleges and to other water programs that these materials are available for their use so that all of the effort and money and expense we've put into developing OER for not only our students, but for the industry actually gets used, right? Actually has benefit beyond the borders of our institution. Thank you so much, Regina, for sharing your, um, your work with us. And at this point, we'll hand us over to Nathan Smith to talk about what's been happening at Houston Community College. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see my screen all right. Um, so uh, I'm the interim chair of philosophy at the at, um, in humanities and library sciences at Houston Community College. Um, one of the cool things is that actually we are now are going to be a philosophy department in the fall. So I will be the incoming chair of that department. Um, we in, but I'm going to talk about uh, my experiences with the Z degree program, which we launched in fall of 2017, and we've um, we started out that um, this was a grant funded act, uh, opportunity um, to develop a Z zero cost textbook pathway in um, in business. Associate of Science and Business Administration in Business, and we um, <clears throat> that was the initial plan. We rolled out um, courses starting in fall seventeen. By the spring semester of um, twenty nineteen, so two f 
four semesters after launching, we actually had the entire pathway built. So we had trained instructors in the relevant courses and had um, either found materials or adapted materials or implemented those materials. At, the, at that stage, we had done very little sort of OER creation, but um, we, um, so we ran with business and at the same time we were building um, an associate of arts and multidisciplinary studies, which is our basically our gen gen ed or general um, our, our general studies sort of associates um, in arts. So that um, we were building that alongside the business um, pathway, um, and and what that has allowed us to do is basically generate a zero cost core curriculum. So in, in Texas, we have a 42 credit core that's actually completely transferable from uh, to Texas state institutions. And um, we can we have those core classes basically offered at most of the major campuses and at online. Um, <clears throat> and because we have that core, we can then add courses in degree plans um, that include the core um, to, to build out their, those degrees. That works really well in the liberal arts. So we've had success with interdisciplinary studies and English in adding them. And we're in the process of getting at anthropology close to a complete associate's degree. Um, the challenge has been more in the STEM areas where we've had less uh, sort of uptake on these um, in these uh, in that um, in the um, OER courses. So um, let's see, go on here. So when we talk about OER at HCC, we have, I mean, sometimes this is a little confusing to folks, um, but we have, we talk about OER internally, we train faculty on, you know, open uh, educational practices, as well as sort of licensing and all that sort of thing. But when we talk to students and when we, we present the programs to students, we focus on the cost. So we have uh, course tags for zero cost books low and low cost books. We also are integrated with the textbook saving, um, a, a larger textbook savings initiative, which includes inclusive access. So we also have an inclusive access tag. So some of our low cost books classes are either OER using some paid for courseware, or they are um, OER plus like certain, some additional texts like monographs and so forth. But when we track our data, typically we focus on the zero cost books or the zero cost books, or at least what we take to, to, to comprise our Z degree pathways. And these are current numbers. <clears throat> um, where, and you can see we have pretty large reach, you know, about 60 unique courses, 260 instructors, uh, over 25,000 student enrollments. That's duplicated seats, um, not individual students um, in, in the classes. And we're probably over $7 million saved since 2017. We're, we're, um, and this is actually calculated based on the real cost of the textbook. So we're not just uh, inserting sort of like a $100 uh, sort of average fee. We're, tra we're trying to actually uh, take the cost of the textbooks and put them in there. Um, <clears throat> to support our instructors and help them kind of get transitioned to OER, we offer an online OER certification course that's a it's a four week course. It's about fifteen hours, and um, <clears throat> takes them through some basics of you know the, the licensing. Uh, we do some course redesign stuff. Uh, we also talk about open pedagogy, and uh, we talk about uh, creation and sharing and sort of and platforms for that. We also have adaptation. We have internal grants through for adaptation, development, and certified courses. So we have a grant program set up internally that follows <clears throat> our um, faculty handbook guidelines for, for grants. I know someone asked a question about how, how much money the stipends are. And in our case, we, um, we are, <clears throat> we're constrained by paying our full-time faculty at our adjunct rate. That's kind of the way that we calculate 
work that is beyond your regular assignment. So um, we have we calculate we have a like sort of the we have 15 hours for the certification. Um, the certified course process is about a um, is a I think it's a 30 hour process. Um, and then adaption and development grants, grants can be can range from 30 hours to uh, uh, 90 hours, which would be the equivalent of a course um, and all of that. We've also developed some some repositories for faculty. Our, our, our librarians have done a, an amazing job developing libguides for various programs to help faculty find OER. And we've also built a hub and just published a hub in the OER Texas repository which sort of curates materials and offers uh, problem uh, uh, resources for faculty. So we have those ways of supporting our faculty to get them engaged in the program. And then one thing the OER coordinator does is try to work with the chairs to ensure that we are staffing and scheduling courses in a structured schedule so that students could actually complete a Z degree. Now, we don't have the great fortune that Regina does where they have a a program where they can actually follow students through and they're getting students to graduate and they can say these students graduated without paying for textbooks. Unfortunately, we just we offer the courses. We can't do any. We don't have a ton of advising and contact with students in terms of their enrollment. What we see is that very few students take five, uh, five zero cost courses in the course of graduating for their degree. Most students dip in and out. They take like two or three courses in the in the process of getting to their degree. So we don't have a lot of students who are completing an entire Z degree pathway. Um, I think we had like one or two who got, you know, maybe uh, halfway there, like 10 to 15 courses. Um, but um, but we don't have that sort of that sort of level of uh, the advising and the high touch that that requires to get students through. I mentioned funding, and we have been um, grant funded since 2017. Um, we've also been internally funded. One of the really good things that our uh, private grant funder, the Kinder Foundation, uh, provided for us was when we submitted the grant, they said, we want a one-to-one -one institutional match on this funding. So we developed internal budget lines to support the program. So that means we have a, a, a release time or alternative assignment for an, a faculty member to serve as the OER coordinator. Um, we have some travel funds, which we used to use back before COVID. And um, I hope, and, and hopefully they will stay there in some form or fashion as we get back into the post COVID world of actually going to conferences. We used to send adjunct faculty, um, we'd send three or four of them to open ed every year. That was kind of the way we used those funds. Um, we have some stipend funds and um, some funds, some small funds for marketing supplies. This has actually been pretty good, big because we put uh, promotional materials in the enrollment offices at all the campuses and give flyers to advisors with the idea that they can tell students how to find our courses. But it's not just the Kinder Foundation grant that we've we've had success. We have a great, a wonderful state grant system through the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and we've been very successful in getting grants uh, for that. Um, <clears throat> and those are grants that go to individual faculty or groups of faculty who are developing resources or implementing them. We had a great success. All of our chemistry classes now, basically their lab manuals are all OER. They've developed entirely OER lab manuals. We have several in biology that are doing the same thing. Um, and then we've had success partnering with other institutions on the Department of Education um, the FIPSI Open Textbook Pilot um, grants. And um, so there was this was one in, in 2020 with OpenStax for computer science. And then we got, we've just been awarded a, one working with the University of Houston downtown to develop chemistry, uh, online chemistry labs. So as we look at sort of success measures, I don't have as nice a slide as Regina did to show the nice upward progress of her program. But what I can say is that we did have done a couple of like pretty careful quantitative studies of the impacts of our program. So one of them was a study that I was the principal author on. It was a zero cost books a study published through Frontiers in Education. And the, the it looked at sort of the early years of implementing our program. 
And we isolated instructors who taught with a traditional textbook and then flipped to an OER. And we looked at the impact of the OER versus this traditional textbook. So we could isolate instructor effects. We also did a number of statistical, different statistical modeling that allowed us to sort of look at um, effects of students. And what we found was that on average, zero cost book students were more likely to pass than those students who were enrolled in traditional textbook classes. It wasn't a huge effect, but it was something that was uh, that we could measure. And then we also saw that um, Black students and Asian students both showed additional increases. So the interaction effect of a ZCB course plus those uh, ethnic profiles seemed to increase. So why is that the case? Not sure, but it is interesting for you, those of those institutions that are that are that are like like ours that are definitely focused on closing achievement gaps um, for underrepresented um, <clears throat> minorities. We also did an internal study where we examined the effectiveness of the zero cost books program, the low cost books program, and the inclusive access. And I think the um, the person in our institutional research. Who's, who's been looking at that is, is, is actually looking to publish something on this. So that will be really helpful. I think it will be one of the first of its kind to sort of examine, to compare OER to the new, the publisher model inclusive access. And what we found was that at HCC at least, um, zero cost books courses tend to have slightly higher success rates. So it confirmed what we saw in the previous study. There are some exceptions. Um, it, it depends on what course. Uh, but for most courses, we saw some improvement. Uh, we saw a couple of courses where it was a slight decrease and lots of them stayed the same. This, the reverse was true for inclusive access. That is to say, we saw a slight decrease in several course areas. So that that's definitely something that, that um, deserves further attention. And I thought it was a really interesting um, look at that. We had some qualitative assessments. I did a, some interviews early on with students. Um, their feedback is really helpful, and I've, I've really enjoyed getting that. I didn't have anything for you here, but um, we have. Um, but I did talk to some students. Their big, their big uh, thing was basically just it just seemed to relieve them of the burden of like carrying around textbooks and and also paying things and freed up money. They were all very appreciative. That's kind of the um, the sense we get from students. They don't know. They don't understand anything about the license type. I just know it's free. So I think we made the right choice in marketing it as a zero cost books. So when we talk about challenges, I'll try to wrap up quickly here. I know maybe talk more about this in the Q and A, but um, <clears throat> I think, you know, we, this is, we have implemented a very large scale zero cost books uh, OER program at a very large urban community college. We have something like 24 campus locations. Um, you know, and and we service like 60,000 students a semester. So the, we can have a big impact. The problem is maintaining consistency and drive across the entire institution. Another thing that we have uh, have had an issue with is early on in our grant, we I was persuaded by the idea that we we could provide uh, subsidies to, our students to, to get access to OER courseware and that the OER courseware would provide a kind of textbook substitute that looked like what the publishers were offering and that that was the most effective way to get people into the program. And I think that was a mistake um, because what has happened is that once the grant money was used up for that purpose, first of all, our funders weren't super excited about that. They didn't, they didn't think it was great to be spending grant money to pay for uh, access to a courseware platform. And with those faculty that I got that were the ad adopters under that system, once the money dried up, they were gone. They weren't really committed to OER. Um, and so I think we're, we've are we sort of had to reconstitute some of that stuff, some of that work. And I kind of, I, I wonder if we could have been more effective at the beginning. I think there's a, an issue around sort of clarity of purpose. What are we trying to do with this program? Now that I've stepped away, we're trying to get have a succession plan with another leader. And I think we're having a little challenge sort of focusing 
Um, we have a major competitor with inclusive access. This is a program that's been pushed by our administration and is being adopted widely at HCC. And it's directly at odds with, I think, what the OER program is doing. And so we continue to see sort of challenges where with our, you know, wondering whether we have the sort of the support and confidence of our top level administrators. So if you're, as you're developing, these are the kinds of things that that really you need to think about. And the final thing, of course, is, is I think for everyone, at, at HCC, we've been especially hard hit by COVID. Our enrollment numbers have not, not returned to pre-COVID levels, and particularly on campus. Our on-campus enrollment is just a shadow of for our former enrollment numbers. And since part of our Z degree pathways, the idea was to have a structured schedule on a specific campus where students could complete their pathways. We don't have enough courses right now to make that happen. And so, um, so we're really, um, that I think is a big challenge as we move forward. I think that's all for me. So I'll go ahead and turn the comm back to, um, back to Shinta, thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thanks to both of you um, for providing us uh, really all the successes and challenges and the data to show us what has worked and what hasn't worked. So I wanna open this up now to a question and answer session. Uh, I know that there's some activity going on in chat throughout the time that we've been together. And I see that uh, there was a question earlier about compensation. James, thank you so much for addressing that in the chat. There is a, a question later on, it could be for both of you. Um, Kimberly Carter asks, I would be very interested in any published studies on student success. Do you have links to studies like that? Or do you have any idea where you could direct Kimberly to, to studies like that? I threw my study in the chat there and you should definitely check the bibliography. I'm gonna go find, um, there was a really good um, meta-analysis done by Virginia Clinton recently. Mm -hmm. And so I'll find that and throw it in the chat too. Thank you, Nathan. Um, we don't have any separate studies. All of our data is pulled by our institutional research office that tracks all of our courses internally and provides us like the success and retention data. They did do a study early on of whether or not students uh, were happy with the transition, but there's no otherwise outwardly published studies. It's all internal data for us. Thank you, Regina. And speaking of students, uh, in the chat, Liz put that in 2018, CCC OER interviewed a student in College of the Canyons Water Systems Technology CTC pathway to see what impact that pathway had on her educational journey. And I just read it, it's quite inspiring. So I'm gonna put it down here again. Um, take a look when you can. It's always wonderful to hear uh, student voices when we can or to hear about the students because at the end of every each and every day in our lives, in our journeys, we do this for the students. So I appreciate that Liz shared that story with us. I have a question. Um, Although there's another question that just came into chat. So I'll, I'll ask this question and I'll save my questions for the very end. So Kate Kaufman is asking um, or saying, we're also being challenged to consider IA versus OER as part of our student affordability model. Are there any talking points you found especially useful when speaking with administration about IA? I find myself losing them when, try, when I try to educate them about IA and need to make the case in a more succinct way. Either Nathan or Regina, if you want to. I mean, I'm I'm just going to. I shared in response to Kate. I shared a link to inclusiveaccess.org, which is a site that was kind of put together with the through the Spark Network, which is an ad, online um, an open education advocacy organization. Um, but the site itself, I think, is fairly balanced. Um, there's questions raised that might be useful. Um, there's uh, I, I will, uh, there's a study actually, you can find it on inclusiveaccess.org by Elizabeth Spica from uh, Tennessee, 
where she looked at the effectiveness of a statewide inclusive access program. And she found similar to, to our results that, that they just don't see the impact, the improvement in student success when you when you go to that. So it's I know it's hard to understand, and I don't know that we fully understand why, but you know, when your goal is cost savings, it looks like some cost savings are good. Maybe zero cost savings would be better, but it's not clear why zero is qualitatively different than a lot, for instance. So from an administrative standpoint, you can understand why administrator was, well, look, faculty get to keep the same materials and they get them at cheaper. However, it seems that what we're finding is that zero actually matters. We I've, we found that at HCC and we see that in other, other studies that actually re eliminating the cost barrier is what you need to do, not just reduce the cost barrier. So I don't know if that helps. Great. That's great. Thank you, Nathan. And just a couple of things, and I'm I'm um, reiterating what is in the chat, just in case some of you might not be able to read everything that is in the chat. Una had asked, having an OER online certification program can be help very helpful. Is that openly licensed? Nathan says yes. It is available in Canvas Commons, um, so that is really good to good to know. Thank you for sharing that, Nathan. And then um, another question uh, from Elaine, are books available for review on wastewater? And Regina shared something in the chat. So make sure you take a look at that and if, if you're interested and, and definitely share it with your colleagues as well. I have a question for, and it could be for either of you. Uh, Nathan, you had, a, you had talked about this in your, um, in your presentation. And I think Regina, you may have alluded to it too leadership support right is is a challenge especially when there is changes or gaps in leadership or alignments not the same um, across leadership levels so is the oer efforts or it are the oer efforts in your institution's strategic plan or is it written anywhere that can serve as a, a guiding document for the work so I am actually going to throw that over to James because he really heads up the OER work at our campus. Um, it again, it's integral to my department. We we have determined internally to the department that this is for us and that it's of great benefit to our students. The majority of the students in our program are part time uh, adult learners. You know, they're older than the quote traditional student and. So this has just been a tremendous impact and help for them. Um, they're more of a, that non-traditional student. But yes, institutionally, oh, James, thank you for popping in. Yeah, real quick, thanks, we're getting, we're getting it. Um, uh, it. It's kind of interesting at College of the Canyons, we had strong support from our executive leadership and strong faculty participation and interest in, in driving OER forward long before sort of the institutional process is caught up and we now reference OER and ZPC degrees in our guided pathways plan, in our student equity plan, and in our um, strategic plan. But yeah, the, the work came about because really innovative faculty like Regina wanted to do the work, not because, you know, an administrator like me wrote some words in a plan that nobody reads, right? It's it's the faculty like Regina who are doing the real work. And thank you for sharing that, James. You're absolutely right. The beauty comes when it's organically driven, right? When it is because people, um, faculty such as Regina, who understand the students because they have those day-to-day -day interactions with students and understand the complexities of their lives are really the ones who are the driving force behind the work. Thank you. And, and Nathan, what about at Houston Community College? Is it written in the strategic plan or any kind of document? You know, we had a strategic planning process when I was OER coordinator, and I I tried I uh, proposed this, um, and the the feedback that I got was that they didn't want to put any specific initiatives in the strategic plan. Um, they wanted the strategic plan to be very to be to represent general principles. Mm -hmm. So we were not able to get something specific to OER in the plan. Um, that said, we're working through right now uh, a strategic planning document for the OER program, 
where we're aligning it with the strategic plan for the institution. And the alignment's very clear. I mean, in terms of like a student success, increased access, um, and we have a personalized learning sort of uh, component to our strategic plan. So there's there's a lot of things that are really um, that are really uh, aligned there. Um, so also I see the chatter in the chat about the um, my uh, the training course, and I am having trouble finding it in Canvas Commons. So I'm going to work on that and see if I can share it with you all. Um, if not, I'll share a resource that's definitely public and free and that's close to what we used. Great. We appreciate that, Nathan. Let me uh, ask in the next couple of minutes, if, are there other questions? And if feel free, feel free to, to raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask it that way instead of on the chat. Una is asking, did either of you work with um, student, student services? Thanks, Una. Yes, we, I neglected to mention, we, when we launched our Z degree, we definitely had, we had um, an adv 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 advising and enrollment, student services dean, and financial aid in the, in the room with us while we were trying to plan that. I think it's been harder to maintain contact with them. Um, you know, most of the, when our, we have an OER steering committee, but most of the conversations in those committees tend to be pretty nuts and bolts about sort of creation of content, finding content, what's suitable for what programs. And, and it's, it's a very academic or, or instruction sort of focused conversation that I think the student services are little disengaged from. Um, so we, we have to figure out how to like engage them on the right level, um, but that's definitely, we need them to partner for sure. We did something where we added OER um, course searching into the uh, student orientation. They do an online or an orientation when they enter. And so we have a slide in that orientation that tells them about how to find um, find courses in the course catalog. Thank you, Nathan. And what about you, Regina? Did you work with student services in your efforts? I didn't specifically out of the department level, but our college does have, um, in listing our course catalog, you know, we do look at, it does identify mm -hmm. uh, low cost courses, ZTC courses, um, OER courses, right? We do have, information for students through that process. But I will say that uh, we talk quite a bit about it at our academic Senate meetings, and it's still we still need better transparency to students when they register mm -hmm. in terms of, but there's limitations within our systems for how to put that information out. So we're we're still struggling with that a little bit. But yes, the information is available if students know how to sort and look for it in their reg registration materials. And Regina, which system are you on? Um, Christy is asking. Oh, uh, James, we're on Datatel, right? Is that what we're still using internally? Yes, James, oh, Banner. Banner. See? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, and and really to that point, um, when we approach a lot of our work, um, much of our work, including this OER work, coming from or using a holistic model that is really truly comprehensive and authentically uh, partner with all the different entities within our institution, that is often the most effective way to achieve our our shared goals. And then when you have teams that are cross functional, once again, that really helps to allow different components of the institution to have ownership of the work so that they can see themselves in the importance of this work. So thank you to, to both of you. Let me just make sure that on chat, there's anything else, any other questions that are being asked here? No. Um, any other questions that you all might have in the minute that we have left before I wrap up the, the webinar? I found the course link, so I've put it in there. And I also want to just highlight Judith Sebesta's comment 
um, we we in Texas we did developed a a Texas statewide playbook that um, with ISKME and and number of people I know Jews was instrumental in kind of in putting that together and writing a lot of it. And it, if you're in Texas, I saw a couple of people from Tex in Texas. That resource is a great one for if you're building an OER pro, uh, OER program on campus. That's great. And maybe the final question here um, is is from Una in the chat for Regina and Nathan. What can you say about funding going forward? It's important, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, it's just something you have to keep fighting for. And I know that again, at our institution, James does a great job of, of trying to push that forward. Uh, through the career education side, we get a lot of dedicated funding coming down through career education. So I'm also trying to use that funding stream to support faculty development of OER, or in our case, the redevelopment and the updating and the constant work that is required to keep all of it in line with our industry partners, what they're demanding. Can we clone James? I wish we could, Una, that would be the best ever. I'll take one. <laughs> and if we could clone um, Regina and Nathan too, that would be wonderful as well. <laughs> I could use that. I was I would say we're I think we're really fortunate in Texas and other states. There are state grants um, that are available. That funding looks like it is solid and is continuing. Um, and the Department of Education open textbook pilot uh, grant is continues to be refunded and even increased. And they're getting to a place where they're encouraging smaller dollar amounts. So I think this is a great opportunity for a system or a district or some collaborators to in community colleges to to apply for some development funding through uh, Department of Education. Um, but I I think it's really important to get some kind of institutional funding. Get yourself a budget line somewhere um, that is dedicated to OER. Um, super important. Absolutely. A budget line that is dedicated to OER, the strategic plan statement or some sort of statement in a, in a guiding document also helps as well. Well, in the several minutes that we have left, I do want to have I have some wrap up slides to share with the audience. But I want to say thank you to Regina and Nathan so very much for sharing your work with us, sharing how it's gone for you and particularly sharing your challenges because it's important for us to hear the good and the bad and because um, it allows us to learn um, as we grow together what should we do what should we avoid what should we not do and that sort of thing so please um audience uh, help me give uh, Regina and Nathan a round of applause you can use your virtual um emojis if you'd like <laughs> Thank you, Regina and Nathan. Uh, so I'm going to share with you a couple more slides for the audience. Okay. We have, um, as we mentioned at the very beginning, this is our final webinar. So congratulations to a, a wonderful, robust lineup throughout the entire fall and spring semesters for a CCC OER. We will be back in the fall with more webinars. If you want to take a look at all of our webinars, um, particularly the spring ones, the, the, the URLs are all there for your viewing pleasure. So please take a look at it when you can. And stay in the loop. Get uh, Keep in touch with us. And so you learn more about what's going on in, in the CCC OER world. So we've got a, a community email that you can um, get information through. We've got on our website, that there's, there's a get involved menu that you can see some upcoming conferences. And if you wanna read more stories, impactful stories about our EDI blog posts and our student OER impact stories, go to the CCC OER website. And then last, but certainly not least, Liz had already put this in the chat. We wanna know, how was this survey? Let us know your thoughts, or how was this webinar? Let us know your thoughts on this webinar. Um, it really truly helps us to know the feedback so we, we know what, uh, what to do next or, and how to do it for our future webinars. So I thank you all again for attending. Thank you again, Nathan and Regina and everybody who contributed on chat and, and vocally. So I, we appreciate your participation. Have a wonderful rest of your semester and good luck. 
Thank you so much, Shinja. It's been such a pleasure to be here. And you too, Nathan. It's been awesome. Thank you guys so much. Likewise, Regina.